guys, it's been a, a great, great day so far, so I try not to look <laughs> again. I really give a lot of praise to, uh, to Hanoch and Lisa and Dorit. It is an amazing, an amazing turnout, and thank you, everybody. So, uh, I'm from Shiva Hospital, and since I stopped to be a department head, uh, I'm uh, involved with the geriatric uh, surgery, and I want to present a case that I think would be a nice summary for what we heard so far. So this is an 86-year-old uh, lady with colon cancer. What else is there? So the story is like this. The woman is 86 old, she, she comes to the hospital, to geriatric, the Department of Geriatrics, due to a D4 fracture, stable fracture. And upon questioning, she lives with a disabled husband, second floor, no elevator. She has been in pain for quite a long time, so she never leaves home because she cannot, okay, she cannot go the stairs. And this, but the spine CT that she did shows thickening of the sicum. So then she, uh, they, uh, she has further questioning, and she said, yes, indeed, she's been uh, having GI symptoms, she's been constipated lately, she's not eating, she lost 15 kilograms of her weight, and then she has colonoscopy, which reveals a colon cancer. For the non-surgeons, this is no good. <laughs> should look like, let's say, like this and not like this. So this is a big, nearly obstructing colon cancer. So she goes to the Department of Surgery. In the Department of Surgery, the surgeon described a fragile-looking lady, 45 kilograms of weight, a frailty score of 5 out of 5, good cognition. She knows she's, she's aware about. She's very depressed, very pessimistic about the situation, uh, the home, the husband, which is not very mobile, albumin 2.5, prealbumin 13, CEA of 25. Where is Dr. Rodnitsky? <coughs> the, the operator is out. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kashtan? No, no, no. no I you pass the question to the, the, okay. the geriatrician. No, 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 no. no. Uh, no, it doesn't have liver mats also. So, geriatrician. Um, so, uh, and that, it's a great question. She, you mean to, I was asked what are her goals. Her goals are bad. An original uh, suggestion let's talk with the patient. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Never heard about it. So, I'm a surgeon. So we talked with the patient. <laughs> we went out of our way and we talked with the patient. And as I said, she was very pessimistic. She didn't believe we could really help her. But I will shorten the discussion. I'll have an, another question for you later about operations. So I'll go for, uh, forward. She's obstructed. She's losing weight. She can, can hardly stand. She needs the operation. So the, the plan of the, operation, the, of the department was um, a, a colectomy with ileostomy. The patient is not happy about ileostomy, she understands, but she does not decline. She said, if we lost to me, I'm not having operation. If we use the risk calculator for this patient, you know, American College of Surgeon risk calculator, just I'll go back for a minute because not everybody in the audience is, is a surgeon. Why? Why resection? Because if you want to treat a tumor, the best way is to take it out. Why ileostomy and not anastomosis? The third? Because you see, you can say that the highest risk for for complications for colon surgery is leakage from an anastomosis. A fray patient leak more, and if a fray patient leaks, his chances to survive are poor. On the other hand. 86 years old, to handle a ileostomy, both technically and both via fluid and electrolyte uh, balance, is almost impossible. So these are two bad choices. What does the risk calculator tell us? Interestingly, I was surprised, because they, they estimate, first the numbers are bad anyway, 
With anastomosis, they calculated almost 40% chances of dying. With the leostomy, even more, which I would guess, but maybe they calculated the consequences of ileostomy. Anyway, this church to rehab facility, look at the numbers here. Delirium, look at the numbers. Functional decline, not so, because she's functionally declined uh, already. So okay, let's ask the audience. To operate or not to operate? To anastomose or not to anastomose? Uh, so I'll, I'll just say, like, you know, it's just like listen to the case. I have to, like two more questions for you. Uh, so like one thing that I always try to like, you know, imagine is that what's the best case scenario? What is the worst case scenario for these patients? So she has like a nearly obstructing cancer, basically. So if you decide not to do anything, what is going to happen? Because like somebody will tell you like, don't even start, like, you know. And, uh, and so for sure, I will say at some point she needs a surgery. Because otherwise, like, she's going to get obstructed, she's going to come to the ER, and, and that's, like, the end of it, for sure. The other thing is that, like, you do have stuff to do with these patients still. Like, nutrition is, like, super, like, low. And we do have way to improve nutrition in a short amount of time. I mean, you can do TPN on these patients for two or three weeks. And she's taking NPO, otherwise she can drink. But like just with the TPN, her nutritional parameter will improve, and maybe she can survive an anastomosis. Okay, you're good if you're looking for a job, come to talk to me. Anesthesia. <laughs> Anesthesia point of view. You, you will see. Well, I assume from the presentation she doesn't have any uh, other serious comorbidities no. that will uh, no. prevent her from surgery. So again, it comes back to the question of what's her best chances. And actually, I want to say that if she's 86 and she has a dependent husband at home, probably what she wants to do is to get home as quick as possible and to be functional enough to take care of him. I think that from the anesthesiologist's point of view, I don't see a great reason not to operate or anesthetize her. I actually want to say that I think she needs a very good surgeon, very quick surgeon, by the way, and with an anesthesiologist that will be able to take her out of surgery quite quickly and to uh, uh, send her home a few days after surgery, preferably without a stoma, by the way. Okay, as a surgeon, I, I'm not sure about the quick surgeon because for a right colectomy, <laughs> the difference between a slow and quick uh, surgeon will be 40 minutes or I mean. Some operation, yeah. Uh, some operations, there is huge difference. But yeah, well, I I chose the. Let's say we we think right colectomy is the easiest of colectomies. So the difference in in, in time is not so major. Please. I would say that surgery here is palliative. Even if she can't undergo chemotherapy or definitive treatment in the future, surgery is probably palliative for her because dying of an obstructive. Got not as a surgeon is probably a terrible way to go. And if we can prevent that from happening, then even from a palliative point of view, I think surgery is probably warranted. But she needs to understand, of course, the pros and cons. Oh, okay, so we, we said that this day was uh, day devoted to uh, rehabilitation. So we did some things. Um, she was presented to our geriatric uh, surgery center and with our uh, devoted and hyperactive nurse practitioner Mila, we started a program. We, we, we succeeded to persuade the surgeon to let her be in the department and not to operate on her for three weeks. In these three weeks, what we did? Uh, she got a TPN plus or a food, whatever she could eat, physiotherapy, a lot of work in walking, tree flow exercise and whatever we can do. She had individual uh, pain management, I remind you. She had a, a D4 fracture, so this is one of the reasons she didn't walk. So they did really good work with her with, with no, uh, no, uh, no narcotics, only very minor do doses of morphine after the operation. A social, a lot of work and uh, improve. What she did is the basic help in Israel, it's nine hours per week of somebody comes to help. We could increase that by much. Psychological, we do not have, unfortunately, I think it's very needed, but we don't have professional psychological uh, assistance in Sheba, but 
we did the surgeon came to talk to her every day and nurses and we did really a lot of work we found out that her hearing aid is not functioning we arranged a new hearing aid a, a exercise to prevent delirium i will not repeat how you do it uh, we involved the family uh, she has two children who live far away and did not see her very much so we we brought them into and of course uh, anesthesia echocardiography pulmonary function test she had a history of bronchiectasis in the past. Basic medicine, we did. So, uh, after three weeks, she gained 3.5 kilograms. And the albumin increased to 3.1, prealbumin increased, and then she had laparoscopic right colectomy. It was found to have a nearly obstructing tumor of nine centimeters in size. It's a sizable tumor, no notes, so we can consider it as curative surgery. CA after operation dropped to one point, and she had anastomosis, and she was very, very happy about it. Now, the next question is, what next? Uh, how, did, how did she go after the operation? She resumed oral food at day five. She was, of course, of TPN1, and no delirium. She was able to walk with a cane. Albumin in discharge 3.6, rehabilitation, or home. I will answer that. Because this was the patient's decision, not ours. She, as, as you said, she wanted to go back to take care of her husband. She, she went back home um, and they uh, were able to climb the stairs and uh, she, we already saw her at the follow-up clinic and she said she's in a much better state than she was before the operation. So I think there is a lot that we can do. And if you allow me, I want to consult the forum, a patient who was not operating yet, okay? So, usually usually when we present, we know already the good result. Otherwise, we do not present. <laughs> Makes sense. So this one, I give you the bottom line, was not operated yet. 97, colon cancer. She lived in assisted living with some uh, living caregiver, good cognition. A uh, minimal is 27 out of 30, looks better than mine, I believe, but she is disabled. Minimal walking, uh, mostly with a wheelchair, she can walk a few steps, uh, due to, she says, it due to weakness, and she has painful knees. Fresh to score was f uh, four out of five, low appetite, but she forces herself to eat, and she maintained her weight. She has some diarrhea and anemia of eight for which she received blood. So she has also colon cancer, but the tumor is not as large, not obstructing. I don't know how long she can live with this. It's not as acute as the previous case. And she is 11 years older. Well? Where is Professor Benjimor when we need him? Professor Benjimor. I, I told you I'll ask you. You are not surprised. No, I'm not surprised. Yeah. No, but uh, for the previous case, I would do exactly the same as, uh, as you said, as you did. And for this case, I would do the, exactly the same. Yeah, exactly try, the try same. to optimize her and operate her. Exactly the same. I want what the geriatric the audience. The geriatrician yeah. try to and evaluating of the risk. Is there anything to improve and to decrease the risk? And if so, elective surgery and optimal surgery. I want to ask a geriatrician if you can answer 97 year old. This condition that I described, uh, medically she is taking a liquid for uh, arterial fibrillation and she had in the past drainage of uh, pleural effusion. But otherwise no uh, acute disease. How long do we expect her to live? Can, can 120. Uh, not by the Bible, by by, many, uh, by science. Can you give a number? I know that you have some tables, you could have some estimates. Big, yeah. yeah. Seven. So I don't know if the tables go up to there. But I think uh, for this patient, it would be really important to involve a geriatrician. I think talking about, really about what her goals are. And then doing a true frailty assessment, because what you're showing us is a little bit of, a, of an eyeballing in a sense. 
um, and kind of understanding what would she want, what are the trade-offs. I, I love what you presented before about the trade-offs, and it's true. And, and we do know, also from our uh, personal data, that 97, if they present as an acute case, then it's better not to undergo operation, because the mortality is rocketing high, and in that case, I would tell this patient that if, after a long discussion, she decides not to have an operation, that's okay, but she needs to understand what's gonna happen. And once she gets obstructed, it's better to get morphine and stay in home or in the hospital, but not to undergo surgery. And I think that patients that are fit enough, and you don't have to be fit, you can actually be mildly frail, or even moderately frail, and undergo surgery in a very good way if you have good social supports which is very important to see what, what social support she has, and also if the patient wants it, right? I mean, that's always the most important thing. Yeah, the other thing that will concern me the most is that like, I see these patients as compared to the other one, like, and I wanted to do like prehabilitation for this one. I'm not sure what the goal of prehabilitation can be here. I don't know if you can prehabilitate anything here. Because exactly. like, she's still away, fine, and she will be in a wheelchair. Yeah, but she's like basically bad bum. Wheelchair. It's, it's a surgical oncologist. When, when, when will this tumor kill her? Does she, what is the median survivor for, uh, she's, she's for a stage, for low stage non-obstructing colon carcinoma? Okay. Now there is always a way to optimize the, the, the risk of uh, postoperative complications, at least with the immunonutrition and with uh, exercise, physical exercise, at least. And this is uh, why we need clearly the geriatrician for evaluation and to prescribe the pre-op pre uh, optimization. I think it's very, it's very, very, very important. But in this case, the problem of uh, the symptoms and the 97 year old patient, the diarrhea may be very terrible for the next future, the next future. And moreover, she has an anemia, she already get uh, back cells, and she may have uh, an important hemorrhage. So the, the surgery is, is not mandatory because of the age, but she, the surgery should be very clearly evaluated and quickly. Okay. Uh, I guess we are still missing a few data points, but even just knowing what we already know, I want to ask everyone or the patient, let's say everything goes well, let's say she has surgery, she doesn't die on surgery, which we, by the way, she has a great chance of dying during surgery. Let's say she does fine, but after surgery, I can almost promise you she'll have delirium. Let's say that after surgery, I can almost promise you that she will have a very prolonged hospitalization. And within the next six months after surgery, she will spend at least two or three months in hospital. Uh, if I was the patient, I would, you know, I would, uh, uh, not even let you touch me. I just want to go home and live my life because I think at the age of 97, people understand that you have to die at some point from something. Now the question is, what is it legitimate to die from? Because you have to die from something. Some people will die from a heart attack. Some people will die from a stroke. Some people will die from cancer. Um, some people die, will die from being in the hospital after surgery, connected to many tubes and suffering from a lot of pain. I'm not sure that, uh, I'm pretty sure that I know the answer for this one. Yeah. When she, she's 97, and she's a lady, so she's probably a pretty tough lady. And she has good cognition. So when she looks you in the eye, I mean, she came to you. She didn't land there by mistake. So what do you see? Do you see somebody who wants to live, or somebody who's like over it? I didn't see this patient personally, but from the information that was forwarded to me, she wants to live. She, she's not depressed and say, I, I had my time, bye-bye. 
No, she she wants to leave. Does she owe her? Not not yet. Yeah. And we we did not do this preparation. That obviously you always can improve and think. I also want you the, the the table that Dr. Olnitsky showed us in the previous lecture. What even in case of successful operation, what are her chances to complete one year, which are not so good? I think she was off the chart that you showed. There was no 97 so many in, in, in this table. But, okay. Just have a question about that. Uh, I think we still don't have enough data. Uh, if we decide at last to operate, is there any significance or a meaning to do segmental resection? Now we are talking about dry collecting, which is somehow a, a <coughs> if it's in the left or sigmoid or rectum. But if there's any consequence to do a to do more, uh, we know that to, mo to do an encolic such a patient is to take more time, uh, which is uh, to have a consequence on the lungs, heart, and other uh, anesthesia problems. So if we have enough data about uh, segmental resection in such patients. I'm not aware of such data. The difference is not so big, uh, yeah. unlike the left It doesn't one. matter. Once uh, it goes to once general it's right or, or, it right or segmental, the no, I thought that the question you were asking is whether to anastomose or not. Th this is a, a big question in this case. Uh, Understand, this lady does not have any other diseases. She, she, she has a, a atrial fibrillation, a liquid, and once she had a pleural effusion. Which so for me, it. her age is only a number, because for me, the geriatrician, she quite a healthy lady, and she can go through this operation. Of course, we should explain her that the first period of after that operation will be quite a hard for her, but uh, after that, uh, and after uh, some period of rehabilitation, she will be able to go home in a healthy, in a better condition. <laughs> but I'm also a geriatrician, and uh, I think that the lady is uh, 97 and the uh, post Almost fully dependent. And I guess that they were, I agree with Mabat uh, that her chances of uh, dying uh, out of uh, something else, not the cancer or the heart, we don't have the statistics, but it seems a high that she'll die in the next one, two years, I don't know, of something else, maybe she'll fall into <laughs> something else, but she's almost fully dependent. And, My impression is that old people have got slow growing tumors. Uh, um, Everything goes a bit slowly, I don't know. Um, and I think to take this patient in terms of the shared decision, the operating is very reasonable. We can watch how things go. And should she have tumor-specific complications such as obstruction or bleeding, there are very good palliative options available at that point as well. So one more thing. So like to me, this case is like a 98% about quality of life. Um, so that would be like the thing that I'm aiming for. This patient's quality of life, I'm not sure it will be better without the cancer yet. What I wanted to say also is that luckily we do have some evidence now to predict, which doesn't mean that we have a crystal ball, but to predict what is going to happen to somebody who has surgery in which like the ADL is close to zero, the Flemish is like four, so way above two, a, the charson is higher, the mobility, the time up and go is nothing. These patients don't do well. So fine, we can operate on that and, and have success, have do an anastomosis and she will be fine. But as one of my friends used to say, like stupid plan doing well still remains stupid. 
and 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 honestly, like we do have science right now to say that this is not a surgical candidate per se. Then, if we wanted to balance everything towards quality of life, there's only one person who can answer this question, and it's the patient. So, but we need to let them understand that there's like higher risk that their quality of night of life will be way worse than what she has right now. I think that one of the interesting things about this discussion is that about 10 years ago we, we did the same discussion on an 87 year old uh, patient and if you, you previously we did it on a 77 year old patient and in the next uh, coming years we'll talk about 107 year old patient maybe I don't know okay uh, listen uh, because this lady is a uh, her cognition is quite uh, good. You should explain here what will be the results of not being operated. And I completely agree with you that the, the decision regarding the operation should be her decision, not mine. But I, as a geriatrician, while looking on this lady, I don't look at her chronological age. I look at her, about her physiologically. So she is a little bit disabled. But otherwise, nothing, uh, uh, no other diseases that uh, will risk her life uh, during this uh, operation. So let her, let her think about it and just explain her what kind of complications she will get as a result of not being operated. And I'm sure she will, she will agree. But uh, this is, this is, some, this is an open discussion. <laughs> I think the chance of the patient having surgery depends on not the age of the patient, but on the age of the surgeon. Young surgeons usually are more risk lovers, I would say. Well, that's, I'm getting to a point, I'm trying to get to it. Young surgeons usually more risk lovers and they think things are going to be better, and more veteran surgeons know better. And they know that things are not necessarily happen the way you want to trying to say that we are not objective as surgeons. And when we have our conversation with the patients, we kind of can, we, we know that most often we can take the patients to whatever decision we want them to make. We can convince them either to go for surgery or convince them not to go to surgery for most patients. And I think that's a bias in our set, set up as surgeons and we mainly need help in having a team uh, reflecting ourselves and trying to understand what is what is the right decision or closest to the right decision because we are not objective. I think that we, we should speak about what bothers the patient. Do we think that she will be a uh, main problem is that she's weak due to her anemia? Do we think that she will be stronger after the operation? Uh, does the diarrhea bother her? Do we think that she will live better with a colostomy after the operation? So I think that the main issue to discuss is what, what, why did we, what did we, what did we do, to, where did we arrive to do the CT scan, and what are the problems that bothers her? Because I'm not sure that uh, an operation will uh, will uh, will make any change in those kind of problems. Thank you very much, Moti. Okay. Uh,